Good evening, everyone. Thank you for your patience tonight. I want to welcome you tonight. We are so excited that you're here. And I want to welcome those of you online as well. Um, my name is Stephanie Holden. I'm the director of Encounter, St. Anne's Adult Faith Ministry. And uh, Encounter um, coordinates all of the faith formations at St. Anne's for adults. We do things like Bible studies, small, um, small group, large group events like tonight, and parish missions, etc. So um, if you work with the ministry, we also coordinate with ministries, and um, we would love to work with you if you um, would like to do like a spiritual event. It's hard to talk in a mask, I apologize. <laughs> Um, we would love to work with you on bringing a spiritual event or um, faith formation to your ministry. So this is Leslie Albazadi. She's one of my good friends. We have known each other for a long time. We love to hike together. We love to have coffee and to chat all the time. So I'm really glad that she is here tonight with me. Um, Speaking of collaboration with ministries, um, I wanted to thank the Women's Council as well as Sister Talk. They have uh, coordinated and planned tonight. Um, we have been planning this event together for a year, maybe a year and a half. So we are so excited, like I said, that you are here tonight. Um, and I just wanted to say that I'm very grateful for them, for their creativity their flexibility and their perseverance because we have had to make a lot of changes <laughs> in the way that we put together tonight. Um, one of our goals or our goal for the evening is to just come together as women of the parish um, or friends of women of the parish and to have a place just to be and to, um, to build each other up and to talk and to share um, during what has been a, a difficult year. So that's what we, we have thought about while we have planned this evening. Um, let's see. So I kind of wanted to explain the evening a little bit. Like I said, uh, there have been a lot of changes to what we had hoped that it would be. Um, I am calling this a hybrid event. Uh, when we first started talking about it, we, our goal was to have Becky come in person. Um, and because of the pandemic, we've had to make a few changes. And that is that we felt that it was important to meet together, but um, she is going to be joining us by video. So we have two videos of her, but then after that, we will have time for quiet reflection. And we gave you journals if you would like to use those. And then we'll have time for small group as well as a large group discussion. So um, that's kind of the way the evening is going to go. Um, and before we start, I need to go through some housekeeping items. And that is, most of you are aware, to please keep your mask on over your mouth and your, um, your nose. Um, and I know that it's difficult sometimes to do that. So if you need to step outside, that's fine. Um, and then to social distance six feet, of course, um, like we're used to, we will not be taking a break. So if you need to use the restroom, please do so at any time. And then lastly, so we can get through all the housekeeping things, is to please not to gather in the narthex, but to make your way outside like we did when we came in. Um, and then we can chat and catch up because I know that's one of the things that we all really want to do together. So that's what I have. So let's just take a deep breath, especially me and my mask, um, and open in prayer. So if Janet, if you would like to come up, Janet is part of the Women's Council, and she will be reading a poem for us. Again, it's really great to see everybody here. Thank you for showing up. Um, what I'm going to be reading is from show this to you. It is a sampler that my mother-in-law did with needlepoint, and it rests in our office at home. She recently passed away, so Elizabeth Young 
did this needlepoint, and I read it every day at home. When you're lonely, I wish you love. When you're down, I wish you joy. When you're troubled, I wish you peace. And when things are complicated, I wish you simple beauty. And when things are chaotic, I wish you inner silence. And when things look empty, I wish you hope. Thank you, that was beautiful. And now I'd like to invite Father Ray up for a couple words. I'm in my civvies tonight. I was running around during the day at different meetings and whatever, and never got back home. Um, I, I first of all want to uh, welcome you tonight and, and thank you for coming to um, spend a little time together. These days are, as you've experienced yourself, often filled with frenetic activity, uh, whether it's frenetic activity of our bodies or certainly of our minds and our hearts. Um, we're all over the place trying to deal with the um, consequences of the pandemic and the emotions that run through this period for all of us. Um, that's why I, I think it's wonderful that you're getting <clears throat> together tonight to share on the topic of hope. Um, I, I love the, the image that you use on the, the screen the image of the anchor, because that is the traditional image of hope, the Christian image of hope that goes back well into, for us as Christians, well into the earliest years of Christianity. Um, hope was never seen as a, a noun. It was always seen as a verb. It, it's, it's an action of our life to bring to other people a sense of peace, a sense of calm, a sense of balance, a sense of meaning, especially when times are difficult and we struggle through them. Uh, obviously, the anchor is the sign that um, we're all in the boat together. Uh, and the boat, of course, is the boat of our, our lives, whether it's family lives, whether it's work lives, um, whether it's community lives, church lives. We're all, in a sense, in the same boat together. And especially at this time, we're on a, a fairly stormy sea. We're on a, a, a sea that's tossing us about to and fro. We get scared in it. It's like that, one, it's like that, that um, story from the scriptures where uh, Jesus sees that happening in the lives of his disciples. And the first thing he does um, is to go out to them. To um, He's on the shore, in one of the stories especially, he's on the shore and he sees them being tossed about. And, and he doesn't stay there uh, waiting for them to come back, or he doesn't stay there waiting for the storm to dissipate so he can go out to them. He goes out in the midst of the storm and he brings them that sense of balance, that sense of peace, that sense of um, the recognition that they're not alone uh, and struggling uh, without God present in, in their lives. And then he speaks the words. You know, he, sp he doesn't speak it to the disciples. He speaks it to the storm. Be calm, you know, be calm. And the wind and the waves obey him, the story says. So most importantly, what I wish for you tonight as you spend some time with each other is to discover where you are the anchor for your families, where you are the anchor for the places you work in, where you can be the anchor for this Christian community called St. Anne's, uh, where you can be the one who comes into the midst of the storms either your family or your workplace or your community is going through. And um, because you're taking time tonight, uh, you can um, hear the words of Christ speaking to you. You know, the, the, the storms will be 
lessened because he's in your presence tonight. The meaning of his life to bring you peace will become clearer to you. Um, his hope will be the infection you need to have and catch um, so that you can bring it out from this church into certainly the lives of your families and your workplaces and this Christian community itself. So I wish for you that sense of peace with him tonight. I wish him to come into the boat that is St. Anne's this evening in this church and speak to the winds and the waves about you. Be calm and they will go away. They will dissipate and you will experience once again um, his presence in the midst of these troubled times. I want to thank you also for um, a very important thing. Um, ever since I've come here, one of my overriding themes has been the theme of collaboration. Um, and, and that's because I know in my heart and I've seen with my eyes um, that when people here work together, great things happen. Great things are always possible, whether they're in the field of, of uh, faith formation or outreach to the community uh, or the worship that we, we do together. Um, all these things become even greater with the potential for finding Christ within them when you all work together. So it, to me, is great that collaborating tonight is encounters, sister talk, as well as the Women's Council of St. Anne's. Um, when, and, and I thank you, I applaud you for doing that, and I encourage you to continue to do those things, things like this, but also to encourage others in the different ministries you may belong in to also continue to work with other groups um, to put things together and then discover the strength in binding yourselves with one another um, for the purposes of um, our mission statement, which is to be a reconciling parish in word, worship, works, and, and sacrament. So um, be the anchor for each other tonight. And when you leave here, certainly be the anchor of hope for the uh, families, the workplaces, and the communities that you are an essential part of. God bless. Thank you, Father Ray. What a great segue to our speaker tonight. Um, our speaker tonight is Becky Eldridge, as most of you know. She is an Ignatian-trained spiritual director. She's a retreat facilitator, and she's an author of two books called The Inner Chapel and Restless Lives and Busy Souls. Restless, sorry. <laughs> yes, busy lives and restless souls, sorry. Um, she leads retreats both virtually and in person, and I've had the privilege of attending both with her, and I have to say both are so worthwhile and meaningful. Um, she uses, because she's Ignatius, she uses Ignat St. Ignatius' spiritual exercises to take people deeper into their prayer life. Um, she holds a master's degree in pastoral studies at Loyola University, and she has a Master of Education at LSU. And she uh, has been involved in ministry for 20 years. And I thought I would quote this because I thought it was so beautiful. She says she has a 20 years of ministry experience in helping people to make room for God in the busyness of their lives and inviting them to go deeper in their walk with Christ. So that's what she's about. And Leslie now is going to give us um, an overview of tonight's evening. Great, thank you. I'll be really brief because I know you're tired of listening to us and ready to listen to Becky. Um, but anyway, so tonight's theme, as you know, is, is hope. And it's uh, rooted in the scripture uh, from Hebrews 6, 19, which is, we have this anchor of hope that is firm and secure. We have this anchor of hope that is firm and secure. And we love, I always love the imagery of just, you know, a boat kind of bobbing at sea and it's directionless and lost. And, and that is not what Jesus offers. He offers us security. He offers us just, we're grounded in him. And so during this tough time, I think for all of us, um, we just need to cling and claim him as our anchor. 
And I'm thinking, I was thinking earlier today as we were coming to gather under, you know, difficult circumstances, I was thinking about the early uh, um, disciples and they gathered under difficult circumstances too. Um, they were afraid and they kind of had to hide, but they still gathered. So I'm just so thankful that everybody's here and that we are able to gather in person. So tonight's theme is uh, Jesus as our anchor. And um, I'm gonna just go right into what, how this first video is gonna, we're gonna roll out the first video. And then when it ends, we're going to go right into a quiet time of reflection. So we just ask that you hold off on conversation. We'll get to that part. So we'll start with our video. And then we'll, um, Ed's going to be playing some music and we'll have some reflection questions up on the screen. So we'll have about 10 minutes of just some reflection time. And then we'll break out into some conversation. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and get it started. Hey y'all, my name is Becky Eldridge and I'm an Ignatian trained spiritual director, retreat facilitator and author. I am recording this from my home office in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, where I share life with my husband, Chris, who we've been married almost 18 years and our three children, Brady, Abby and Mary. And while I would give anything to be with y'all in person, I am so grateful for this opportunity for us to connect virtually in this way. And I'm excited to share with you in these two video reflections, just some thoughts on something that is very near and dear to my heart. And just something that has helped me maneuver this past, especially this past year, of change and uncertainty that I know we have all been facing. My wise beloved grandmother who I grew up next door to, her and my granddad, they were seven stepping stones apart from us as kids growing up. Both of my grandparents were full of wisdom. And one of my, the things my grandmother used to always tell me growing up and even into adulthood is she would say, Becky D, that's what she called me, Becky D, you know one of the things that we can count on in life? And I would go, what? What is it? Tell me what it is. And she said, we can count on change. And I don't know about y'all, but that is not ever what I wanted to hear her say. Right? I didn't want, I wanted her to tell me things were not going to change. That there was going to be some stability. And she would chuckle and watching my facial expression as I was bemoaning the change that I was talking to her about. And she would then remind me, don't forget that there is something else that we can count on. Some, and she said, it is not a something, it's actually a someone. And that someone is why we are gathered here tonight. To the someone to celebrate is Jesus, God, the Holy Spirit, right? The unshakable Trinity and their unshakable presence in our life. And the gift that uh, we, they give us is this beautiful virtue that we are here to talk about of hope. And for us to hold on to this anchor of hope, as it says in Hebrews, Right? Hebrews 6.19, it's one of these scriptures I invite you to jot down, which says, we have this anchor of hope that is firm and secure. And this anchor of hope that is firm and secure is what has kept me going this past year. Because one of the great things about hope, when we really think about what hope is, and I want you to think about this for a second, if someone came up to you and asked you, tell me about hope and tell me about Christian hope, right? Because we got to get clear on the type of hope that we are talking about. It is not the hope of wishful thinking, of, of optimism, of dreaming, right? I hope, I hope this, I hope that, I hope that. The hope that we are talking about is hope that is infused in us by God alone, 
right? It is hope that finds its meaning and its purpose in the person of Jesus. And I always remember when I, one time I was asking this question about what is the difference between hope and Christian hope at a parish mission here in Baton Rouge. And this little boy up front on the front row in the pew, when I asked the question, he like put his hand up, you know how kids do, and they're like, oh, me, 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 pick me, you know? And I'm thinking, do I call on this kid or do I not? Like, what is going to come out of his mouth? But he said, when I called on him, I was like, all right, little man, what do you got? Tell me, tell me, what, how would you define the difference between hope and Christian hope? And he said, well, Miss Becky, he said, hope is what we all want to happen when LSU plays Alabama, right? We hope that LSU creams Alabama, right? A little go Tigers. I'm a, I'm a LSU Tiger fan. And the whole congregation, I mean, everybody in the thing, um, in the church just died laughing. And then he said, but he said, Christian hope has to do with Jesus. And that is what I want us to remember and to reflect on is that this anchor of hope we have has a visible person for us to look to. As it says in Colossians 1.15, he, meaning Jesus, is the, makes the invisible God visible to us, right? Our hope has a name, and his name is Jesus Christ. He, the hope that we are here to talk about and reflect on is the essence of this Easter season that we are in, right? The invisible God made visible to us in the person of Jesus. So I want us to think for a minute about the gift of hope that Jesus offered to us and made visible to us. And then how does that hope translate into our lives today? So starting with, um, I want us to think about three different scriptures. And let's start with one of the great miracles that Jesus performed that we read about and watch in scripture happen. And that is the, the scripture of the loaves and the fishes. And when I think about hope and what Jesus offers of us, I often think of the acronym for hope that stands for hark, open, pray, and encounter. Right? Hark, open, pray, and encounter. And when we think about, again, what Jesus made visible to us. He made visible to us this model of hope that involves these four parts, right? Of noticing, opening, pray, praying, and then an encounter happens. So if we think about the loaves and the fishes, we have the disciples, everybody's gathered out on the, the, the hill, right? Thousands of people, and the disciples notice something. Right? They hark. Hark means to intently pay attention. And they notice the need of the people, which is they're hungry. And so they take the need that they see, and they go open and bring the need to Jesus. And there's this exchange happens, you know, that the disciples go to Jesus, and they're like, hey, the people are hungry. We need to send them home. And then he says something key. He says, you go feed them yourselves. So then the disciples come back to the hill filled with people, gather up their meager offerings. And then again, they open and bring what they have to Jesus. Who, so they bring the loaves, the little loaves, the little fishes that they gathered up. And together, Jesus prays with them. And this multiplication happens. And there is an encounter with hope, right? God was made visible in that moment of multiplication, right? Again, there was a noticing, an opening of the need, bringing it to, to Jesus. A prayer happens, an encounter with hope, right? Let's think about another moment in scripture where we see this beautiful story of the paralyzed man on the mat, right? Thinking about the one in Mark, especially. And again, we see four friends who noticed a need of a person. They harked, they paid attention that their friend 
is paralyzed on the mat. And they take, each of them take a corner of the man's mat and they bring him to Jesus, right? They drop him through the roof. They open to Jesus. And when that man ends up in front of Jesus, an opening happens between the two of them, right? Jesus to the man, the man to Jesus. And Jesus, again, through his words, offers a prayer and invites the man to stand, rise, take up your mat, and go home. That day, that moment, an encounter with hope happened, right? The invisible God was made visible to us. And then the last one I want us to think about is this beautiful moment in John's gospel where Jesus sees the paralyzed man next to the pools of portico. And here, this man has been crippled and paralyzed for 35 years. And I mean, y'all, there are so many things in our own life that we hold on to and that can cripple us because of us holding on to things for so long. For just like the man. And so here he is, this man at the pools of Portico, and he cannot get into the water, right? The story is that if he can get into the water when the water's ruffled, that he will be healed. But because of his ailment, he can never get there. But again, y'all, Jesus parks. He notices him. He pays attention. Jesus opens to the man. And when Jesus opens and goes over to the man, the man opens to Jesus, right? There's an encounter between the two of them. And then there is a prayer. In the opening, Jesus offers healing to the man. And again, an encounter with hope happens, right? The invisible God is made visible not only to the man, but to the people around him. And so this is what I want to offer us around hope in this video, is for us to think about how does Jesus's gift of hope show up in our lives and how can we anchor into this gift of hope, this virtue of hope that Jesus offers us. Always remembering what St. Thomas Aquinas teaches us is that hope, like faith and love, are infused in us by God alone, right? So the source of hope is God. It is not ours to do alone, which always gives me such great comfort on those days that I'm struggling to hold on to hope, right? So thinking about our own lives, number one, let's look at the H, right? Heart. How can we anchor into hope? Starting with the noticing. And so the first thing I always invite people to, especially when we're in a time like we've been living this past year, is to first pay attention and name the real, right? Name the real of our lives. When we think of those three scriptures that we talked about with hope, all three of them began with naming the real, right? The disciples named the hunger of the people. The friends named and saw the man who was paralyzed on the mat, right? Jesus named the real and encountered the man next to the pools of portico in the realness of his life. And that is where hope begins with us, y'all. Hope begins with us naming the real of our lives. This past fall, I was able to still make my silent retreat. Um, it was like in that little season between um, the, the numbers had kind of been declining. We weren't right at that beginning of the fall upswing. And so I was able to go away for my silent retreat, which I make one every year. And when I got into the silence and paused and kind of was still and just quiet, everything that had been kind of I've been, I had been holding and kind of pushing at bay, came and rose to the surface. And I'll be honest, it overwhelmed me, right? I was overwhelmed as I was still enough to kind of tend to the real of my life. But I, all the suffering, right? The suffering that I had 
what had experienced myself that I had watched loved ones go through this past year, that I had sat and hold so much space and heard so many stories of suffering in ministry, right? Through spiritual direction, through retreats, and it overwhelmed me. And as I tried to tend to it, right, in the quiet, the words kind of stirred in prayer from God, and it was, Becky, tell me, right? And the three phrases were, Becky, tell me what you see, tell me what you hear, and tell me what you feel. And so that is what I want to invite you to and give you permission to do tonight is to name the real of your life to God, right? Tell God, tell each other, right? When y'all break into small groups, tell each other what you have seen, heard, and felt, or you are seeing, hearing, or feeling in the present. And because our hope starts, right? With naming the real of our life, right? Bringing the real of our life to God. And so it's naming it not only aloud to each other at times, but even more importantly, naming it to God, right? Naming it to Jesus, trusting that they hear our prayers. So I want to invite you to name the real and to tell God what you see, what you hear, and what you feel. Because in, in our Christian faith, hope does not give us permission <laughs> to be an ostrich, right? What do I mean? Um, there is no, we are not invited to put our head into the sand. There is nothing naive or ignorant about hope, about our Christian hope. Um, Jesus never was naive or ignorant about what he saw, right? He encountered people in the real of their lives. And so I want to invite you and encourage you to have permission to name the real of your life tonight, right? Starting with trusting that God hears you. There are so many, just to give you more permission of where, where does this come from in our Christian faith, right? Just think for a second about the Psalms. And so many of our Psalms are great Psalms of lament, right? Psalms of crying out. And one that I um, think of often is um, in Psalm 130, and it's, um, you know, Lord, I cry out to you. Lord, hear my prayer. And so hope starts, I, us anchoring into hope, begins with naming the real of our life, right? Trusting that God hears us, that Jesus hears us and sees us in what we're holding. So as y'all break and kind of come into some small group or large group conversation, however y'all end up doing it, I would like to invite y'all to do as Jesus did and the disciples did and those friends did and to pause and just tell me, right? Not don't tell me, tell Jesus, right? Name the real of your life and anchor into this gift of hope trusting that God sees you and hears you and will meet you in what you are holding. Know of my prayers for you, and I look forward to being um, back with y'all in just a bit where we are going to look at the other two other ways that we can anchor in to this gift and virtue of hope.
I can't separate my papers. <laughs> yeah, okay. um, yeah, that was beautiful. I love that acronym, HOPE. And if we look at it, we have to start with the heart. We have to start with the notice before we can get to the encounter. And life is so busy, sometimes it's just hard to notice. And if we can't notice, it's really hard to realize we've closed up and that we need to open up in order to receive Jesus in that encounter. And I love what she said about giving ourselves permission. That is, I find sometimes when I'm struggling with something that I realize I have to give myself permission either to be upset about it, to grieve it, to allow those feelings to come up. So that's, I, I, that's such a great acronym to remember in those challenging times, to stop and notice, to be open to receive the gift that God has for us, the prayer, and then the encounter where we just come face to face with Jesus who is our hope. I mean, I don't know how you get through without him. You know, sometimes that crying out, as she mentioned, the lament, just cry out to Jesus. I mean, I've stood in my kitchen and just said, Jesus, help. You know, that, that's what he wants is our cry because that's just being real. That is letting him into the innermost part of our struggle. Um, he can't come in if we don't let him. So just such a beautiful, um, beautiful acronym. I don't, I, don't, I don't think I'll forget that. It's really great. All right, so what we're going to do is if you would like to share with those around you, um, you can kind of reach over to somebody by your side or if you came in a group, um, feel free to kind of cluster. Um, and if you're not comfortable with that, that's okay too. We are gonna have some questions that we're putting up on the screen. Oh, they're there, right? Sorry, they're there. Um, so tell me what you see. First of all, name the real in your life. Tell me what you see, tell me what you hear, and tell me what you feel. And if you'd like to break out and share that with your um, folks around you, or maybe just, if that's hard to share, maybe just something that struck you from Becky's presentation. So we're gonna take a few minutes to do that, so um, feel free to, to share if you would like.
Okay, it was, it's, we're gonna um, take a little pause for a minute. You, you know you're in a room, in a room you're, you know you are with a room full of women when, you know, we're all chatting like this. It's been a while since we've been together, so it's really, really heartwarming, and I hope um, it's filling you up to just be able to share. So it's really, really great. So our next video, um, oh, before I mention the video, um, because we're not doing a break, if at any time you need, like, a little bit of air or need to use the restroom, just please feel free to go ahead and just get up and at, at any time. So I think Stephanie already mentioned that, but just in case. Uh, in our next video, Becky's going to highlight the promises of God, which scripture is filled with. And it's such a beautiful practice to go and seek out some of those scriptures, but she's going to highlight some of those promises for us. So be listening to, to those and see which one Resonate, resonates with you this evening. And the other thing she's going to comment on, so pay attention or have a listen to this, is a still point in your life. So be on the, be on the lookout for those couple of things. Um, God's promises and a still point. So we're going to go ahead and cue up our second video, and we'll do the same thing, which is a 10-minute quiet reflection right after, and then we'll do some sharing as a group. Hey y'all, welcome back. I hope y'all had good conversation and reflection around our first our first piece of this reflection on anchoring our hope, right? Anchoring into our hope, anchoring our hope in the promises of God. So where, where we just came from again, right? Was how can we begin to anchor into the hope, into hope by naming the real? Right? Naming the real, harking and paying attention. And what I want to offer us this next is how can we, as we name the real, right, and open and bring it to God, how can we continue to open and pray and receive this encounter of hope? When I think about a story that illustrates um, what we're talking about tonight, there was a moment that I've that completely reminds me of this that happened in our family in July. And, you know, just how life has been this past year, it's been such, again, an unexpected year of change and uncertainty and, and things shifting. There was a Thursday morning, just a regular old Thursday morning in July, that we were here in the house as a family. My husband and I are both now working from the house, <laughs> just like so many families are. The kids were home because it was summer. And this Thursday morning, I had just walked into my office where I'm recording this video. And our middle daughter, Abby, was in the kitchen and she was unloading the dishes, right? Normal thing. She is in sixth grade. Her and her brother, the, our oldest, um, our son, they rotate doing chores, right? So every other week, it's dish duty for her. So I share that because she had done dishes for many, many, for a long time, right? This wasn't a new thing. Well, all of a sudden, as I'm standing in the office, I hear this loud crash and then cry. And so I run into the kitchen to go see what is happening. And at, thankfully, my husband got in there before I did because there was glass everywhere and combined with glass was a decent amount of blood. And so by the time I gotten in there, my husband has Abby at the sink and I just see him holding her hand very tightly, right? She, he's holding her hand and, and I'm like, I see, see his face, I see my daughter's tears and I'm like, okay, what do you need me to do? Do you need me to go get a Band-Aid? And so I go start heading into our bathroom to get a Band-Aid and my husband, Chris, calls and he's like, Becky, no, I need you to go get your car keys. Like we got to take her to the ER. So still not fully computing like what is going on. 
I get my car keys, we jump in my little black minivan and um, we head over to the ER. And um, when we get there, I finally have the courage to look at her cut and see what has happened. And lo and behold, this poor bae had sliced her pinky all the way through um, her tendon down to the bone, right? Normal Thursday morning, doing something so regular that she has done a million times. And then that day, as she had taken a, a stack of plates and was going to put them up into the cabinet, her foot caught the open dishwasher door and she had whacked and landed right on top of the plates, right? So here we are, unexpected change, um, life going in a little bit different direction than we, we intended that day. And as we are waiting in the ER, we find out pretty quickly that um, just normal stitches are not going to do, that she's going to have to go have surgery so that they can um, go find the tendon and like pull it back up and repair it. And because Abby had eaten breakfast that morning, we found ourselves in an eight hour wait, waiting for surgery to happen. I think an eight hour wait for any of us um, would be a little bit hard. But for an 11 year old who was doing something brand new and had had a pretty traumatic morning, the wait became agony for her. And so as my beautiful little redhead, blue eyed daughter is sitting in the bed, um, she just, she is so afraid and she's so nervous. Like her whole body just keeps shaking, like she's shaking. And I keep, I, what I kept doing was I would go over to her and I'd put my hands on her face and kind of cup her face. And I'll just say, abs, look at me. Just look at me. Like, it's going to be okay. Like I'm right here. Dad is right here. We're going to, you're going to be okay. And I asked her, I said, what is it that you're so afraid of? And her response is one that holds so much wisdom for all of us. She said, Mom, I've just never done surgery before. And as she said those words, I thought, gosh, how many times when we face something in life is our greatest fear not knowing because we've just never done it before, right? We've just never done a pandemic before. We've never done so many things, right? When, when we hit these moments, that we struggle to hold on to hope. It's often because we're not sure, right? We're not sure of our way. We're not sure what to do. And we've just never done it before. And as she said those words, and as I was, you know, again, I had my, face, my hands on her face and I was looking at her. And I could see that as she gazed into the eyes of somebody who loves her, that her body would still and that she would calm down. And there's a handful of times in my life, as a mom especially, but I can say this also as a minister in ministry, that I, am, I understand the overwhelming responsibility and call to be somebody else's still point, right? To be a face of, and a fixed point that they can look at and that our presence alone, my presence alone, can help calm them down. And every time I've encountered a moment where I am called to step up and to be this face of love um, that can be a calming presence to somebody else, I find in the back of my head this little question arises. How can I be someone else's still point, right? Be a face of hope for them if I do not have someone myself to look to, to be my still point, to help me anchor into hope, to help me just have something that can calm me down. So what hope offers us, right? Again, we have this anchor of hope that is firm and secure, is we are offered a still point or a fixed point that can give us something that we can look to, 
Right? This was my grandmother's second piece of wisdom. Yes, change is going to happen. And we always have someone. Right? And that someone that we can look to is Jesus Christ. Right? The, the one who makes the invisible God visible. And the one who can help anchor us and ground us and still us. Our pastor um, here, Father Randy, at our church um, in town, he has on his wall this painting that says, Jesus is the still point in the turning world of chaos. And so when we think about hope and what Jesus offers us as we notice the real of our life, right? Just like Abby named the real of her life, the fear that she was holding. And she opened and she brought it and shared it with me, right? What Jesus offers us is a place to name the real, someone who we can always talk to. And that as we open to him, he opens even more to us because he's always there. And as we open to him, especially in prayer, and when we receive the sacraments, that an encounter with hope happens, right? The invisible God becomes more and more visible to us. And one of the many reasons, like if somebody was asking me, Becky, how can you have hope today? One of the first things I would tell people is, I can hope because I know we are not alone. I know that I am not alone. And I know that I am not alone because of this beautiful space within us that I call the inner chapel, where God resides where Jesus, in the Last Supper, right, he promises his disciples that he will never leave them orphaned. And he says, I am going to send you an advocate who will be with you always and who will be within you. And so each one of us, y'all, has this anchor of hope that we can lean on all the time. And it starts with this beautiful promise of God of knowing that we are not alone, right? That God is always with us, residing in the sacred space called the inner chapel. And the gift of prayer that helps us anchor into hope, as we keep coming to God, to Jesus, being with the Holy Spirit in prayer, we come to discover the promises that God makes to each one of us, right? Promises such as, we are not alone, right? That God is always with us and will never abandon us. Part of the promises that we discover, promises such as knowing that Jesus invites us personally into relationship. The same way Jesus invited every one of his disciples, the way that he invited those people on the grassy hill at the loaves and the fishes into relationship with him or the paralyzed man on the mat, or the man at the pools of portico. Each person, each one of us matters to Jesus. And we are invited and called by name into relationship with him, right? To have this beautiful personal relationship. And here in this sacred space, this inner chapel that we can come to daily as our still point, Right? That's why I love prayer. This is why this is my life's passion and work, is helping people embrace this gift of prayer. Embrace the ways that our Catholic tradition has laid out for us to be in relationship with God. So that we can come to know him on a personal level. And that we can come to understand the promises that each one of us is offered. Right? So again, promises such as we're not alone, that we're called into relationship. And in this relationship, in this space where we are opening and being together with God, with Jesus, with the Holy Spirit, we have a place and a promise of rest. Right? Like Jesus says, come to me, all who are weary, and I will give you rest. In this relationship, that we can nurture and, and anchor into through prayer. 
we come to know that we always belong, right? That we always have someone that we belong to and who claims us. And I want you to think about in your own life, in the world around you, how great the cries are, right? Of ourselves, of other people who feel as if they do not belong, right? That they don't have a place, a person, a community to belong to. But one of these unshakable things, right? My grandmother's wisdom again, that is unchanging, is that we always belong to God. We are God's people, right? To whom we belong. This is Psalm 100. We are God's people to whom we belong. He claims us. He made us. So that is a promise that we can anchor into that helps us increase our hope, right? That we belong. The one that we belong to is also the one who unconditionally loves us, right? That there's nothing that we can do that will keep us from being loved by God just as we are. And it is, it is in the sense of belonging and knowing that we are unconditionally loved that our identity is secure, right? It is this unshakable identity, again, that we can anchor into. It's part of our hope. And it is who we always are, right? No matter what changes in life, is who we are in God, right? And right next to me, I'm gonna pull it off my wall right here. I have this painting that says who, I know it's probably gonna be backwards on the video, but it says who I am in God is who I am. Who I am in God is who I am. And that is the same promise for every single one of us, right? Our identity is secure. And because we are simply beloved children of God, right? Who we are. And let me tell you, we try to tell ourselves all kind of lies about our identity. And this is where God's great promise of mercy comes into play, right? God's promise of mercy that helps us reimagine our lives. And when I think of Jesus and one of the many names I call him, friend, um, you know, companion, one of them is the great reimaginer. Jesus' promise of mercy, right? What he makes visible to us is the, the ability to reimagine our lives, right? The ability to take what we think is um, broken beyond repair to take those places of unforgiveness or unfreedom and reimagine new life. This is what the Easter season is about, y'all. It is God and reimagining death, right? And offering us the hope of the resurrection. And so when we think about our identity and mercy, um, I, I want us to think for just a bit on Father Henry Nowen who offers us five lies that we tell ourselves about our identity, right? The first one is, is he says, we try to tell ourselves that we are defined by what we do, right? The roles we play in life, um, you know, what we, what we do with our time. The second lie he says is we try to define ourselves by what we have. Right? The relationships we have, the accolades we've received, money, things, uh, stuff, on and on, right? Our gifts, our talents. And in both of those, um, he reminds us, no, our identity is not in what we do. It is not in what we have, what we own, what we possess. It is in who we simply are before God, right? Our identity is reimagined. Father Henry Nowen also reminds us that sometimes we tell ourselves these other lies, right? We, we say that we are only what somebody else says we are. Or maybe, lie four, that we only are the best thing we've ever done. Or number five, we are only the worst thing that we've ever done, right? That we tell ourselves that we are only who other people say we are. 
and again, when we look to scriptures that's, that mirror our own life, think of how many people in scripture have, are wrestling with their identity being defined by somebody else, by society, by family, by friends, right? Who maybe ostracize them, let them say they don't belong because of who they are, what they've done. Maybe even their sickness, their ailment. And so for us, we often find ourselves seeking and searching, who am I? And again, God's promise of mercy that Jesus makes visible to us, right? That the Holy Spirit births in our lives is reimagines who we are and helps us reimagine the possibilities in our life so that those places that we're struggling to forgive or receive forgiveness, that God's mercy comes in and helps us reimagine that that's possible. Or maybe those areas of our lives that feel heavy, bound, unfree, that the gift of mercy comes in, right, out of God's love for us and sets us free and unbinds us, right? So these, this great gift of mercy. And out of all of these, this God's love for us of, of unconditional love and mercy is this great promise that we have a companion in our suffering and that we have someone who gets suffering and can walk with us in it, right? That's just what we've come out of this season of Lent, remembering what Jesus understands and that we can name the real to him, right? We can tell him about our suffering because he himself suffered. Because the reality is, y'all, we all belong to clubs that we wish we didn't belong to, right? We wish maybe we didn't belong to this club of a pandemic. Or maybe there's aspects of our life and suffering that we wish we didn't have to go through. Um, I know for me in my own life, I wish that um, walking with someone with terminal brain cancer was not something that I understood, right? My husband and I cared and took care of my beloved grandfather and walked with him um, through a terminal brain cancer. I wish that I didn't understand addiction and the impacts that it can have on an entire family system. But that is a journey that I have walked, right? That I have watched um, a very beloved family member struggle with an addiction. And I understand that way more than I wish I did. But this is a, these are clubs that maybe we wish we didn't belong to. And yet Jesus too had things that he experienced in his suffering. I mean, not only just at his passion, but throughout his life, right? He knows what it's like to be misunderstood. He knows what it's like to have his words misconstrued or to maybe not belong somewhere. So again, a way for us to anchor into our hope is to turn to the, our companion in our suffering, right? And to take the real of our life and name it to him, open to him, talk to him in prayer. Because then an encounter with hope happens within us as we come to understand and receive these promises that each one of us is offered, right? Again, promises such as we're not alone. We always belong. We are unconditionally loved, offered mercy. Our identity is secure. And we have someone who can walk with us in what we are going through and facing. And just like Jesus made the invisible God visible to other people, so too are we called to help make hope visible in the world today, right? We are called to be and to bring and, and make encounters of hope happen, right? To be a vessel of hope for other people so that we can offer this very anchor of hope that we receive that we are given, that we that is firm and secure in our life, that we can offer this to other people and help them find their way to what we too have received. So as we close, 
I want to invite you again to think about this acronym of hope, right? Hark, open, pray, and encounter. And to continue in the days and weeks and months ahead to give yourself permission to name the real, right? Take the real of your life and name it to God. Hark open, right, in our naming, in our dialogue and conversation with God in prayer. We are opening to him, and we are inviting him to open to us even more. He, God is always there, but it is this beautiful widening and opening that happens within prayer, right? So we can name the real, open, pray, and in that relationship that builds through prayer, we begin to receive and understand these promises. That, that as we receive them, we can then go and share them and offer an encounter with hope. We can be a vessel of hope to others. So keep remembering that hope is here. It is your anchor and mine. And that we never hope by ourselves. And as y'all break into conversation, I'd love for y'all to reflect on two things. Number one, first of all, what is the promise of God or promises of God that you most need to and want to remember and that you need to cling to in these days ahead? And second of all, where are you being invited to be a herald of hope, a vessel of hope to whom is God inviting you to proclaim this beautiful message of hope that we each receive? Know of my continued prayers for you, and I so look forward to being together with you um, in October. And just, again, know of my prayers, and I look forward to seeing y'all in a few months. Bye, y'all.
hope is here. I don't know if you guys caught that. That was really powerful. Hope is here. And sometimes it can be kind of bleak and we forget that hope is here. He always is here. Um, as one of the promises she mentioned, the first promise is God never leaves us alone. That's something beautiful to cl just claim and cling to when times are tough, that he is here. It's awesome. I forget all the time. <laughs> so um, important to have, you know, that community of sisterhood that reminds us that hope is here. So with that, we are going to open it up to a time of group discussion. So we've got a couple of questions that are on the screen right now. So if there's anybody, Stephanie and I will walk around with a microphone. So if you would like to share um, either something from the questions on the screen or something that may have spoken to you um, through the video or maybe through a conversation with somebody else, uh, it would be a real blessing to just share those with one another. So if you have something, just go ahead and raise your hand. I loved how she spoke of that sacred space in the inner chapel. Uh, being a visual person, my mother always said, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. So that kept me from putting yucky things in <laughs> because I would think, oh God, I don't want it to be in his temple. But I love that inner chapel and just the thought of praying within that inner chapel. I thought that was beautiful. And um, as far as who to wear or to whom to be a vessel of hope, I think our children. <laughs> and I just see the frustration with this past year and not knowing what to believe with, you know, our media and all that, that just to be a hope that to rise above it and let Jesus be your hope, nothing that you're hearing out there. Love that it is that inner chapel, that that sacred space within that um, we can commune with God anytime, anywhere, all day long. Um, I think that's what Paul meant when he said, "Pray without ceasing to be in that space." But yeah, that was beautiful. Anybody else? I, I've, I don't know how to connect this as well. It's connected in my head, but I don't know if I can get it out. But um, what promise of God do you want or need to remember? And I just have a real sense of, of God's power being bigger than me and that he can work through me even when I don't know how he's working through me, and even when I don't know what to say or do to help myself or someone or a situation. Um, that God can work through it, and it's just that, that, that inner place of quiet that, of opening my heart and saying, okay, you know, and I, I may still make mistakes, but God can work through my mistakes. That made perfect sense. I love that. Yeah. I mean, we can't be a still point for somebody else if we aren't first connected to the still point, with a capital S, the hope. We can't be that for others if we don't have that connection with him. So, and that starts with being open. It's so hard though. <laughs> and sometimes, Anne Marie, I think I think you're so right. And you know, trying to be there for people, I think that um, sometimes just presence. You know, it's not necessarily knowing what to say or just trusting that your presence is enough to be that still point for others. So that was beautiful. Um, to me, uh, the promise of the, of the Lord, for me, is very simple. And um, because he said he will never leave me until the end of time. He will always be with me. So that is very comforting to me. And also, he said he had to leave, but he's going to prepare a place for me. And if he would not, he wouldn't have told me so. 
So I am very confident because the faith that we Catholics have, and you know, I'm I'm not afraid of the future because you know, since I've been alone since '79. I've been by myself all this time. If it wasn't for God, I would not be here. And also, I guess because I've journeyed with the Lord for a long time, and uh, I am who I am. So I am always try to be open to be a vessel. So whoever needs me, you know, I, I'm not afraid to share my faith. I'm not afraid to help. So that's just me. Thank you, Sabrina. Is there anyone else who has a, a promise that they'd like to share? Um, when I look at that first question, I always think about when I first started working with children and parents, I thought I was in control. <laughs> it's when I retired and came back to work with parents and children that I realized God was in control. And so I think that's my inner peace is the longest journey is from the mind to the heart, but when I let go of my mind and let God guide my heart, I see the vessel that he needs me to be for whoever's in front of me. That's so true. I guess he lets us think we're in control, right? <laughs> but yeah, just to be there, I think just um, be open. I think that's, the, that's really what, what God calls each of us too is that openness, that openness to him, that openness to others, so we can be conduits, so we can be vessels of that grace, of that mercy, of that love to share with others, especially when we're in a season of really needing to cling to hope. What an honor to, to, to be able to do that for him and for others. Any other thoughts? Yeah, uh, when Ed was playing his music, I was uh, writing some stuff down, and I sort of got lost. And the next thing I see is I wrote this stuff down, and I feel like God spoke to me tonight, and I just wanted to read w what I wrote that I didn't know I wrote. <laughs> um, God promised, seek and you shall find. Knock and the door will be opened. When one door closes, a window is opened. Rest in me. Feel my love. I will never leave you. Walk with me hand in hand. Don't be afraid. Trust in me. Thank you, Mary. Knock and the door shall be opened is one of my favorite lines in scripture. I think so many times that we think that we don't need to ask, but we do need to be open, like Leslie says, and to ask God, even though he's always there, and to invite him in, and that's so important in order to, like Becky says, have a deeper relationship with Jesus. Does anybody else want to share? Um, a friend of mine shared with me yesterday um, a devotion that he was reading, and it was about St. Teresa of Alvila and how she was saying that we need to be God's hands and feet on earth. And when I was reading that question, where or to whom are you being invited to be a vessel of hope, it made me think of that, because the very last line in that was that we might be the only Jesus that anyone ever meets. And so that we are vessels of Christ. And so we need to share that hope with the world. Thank you, Kathleen. Um, one of the lines in scripture that the La Salettes um, are so privy to is that we are to be ambassadors of Christ. And I think in the way that we live our lives, like you say, we are to be vessels to others, but to be points of light and people can see us and realize that we are Christians and that they will be attracted to us because of the way we live our lives. And I think that's one of the things that Pope Francis talks about so much is that we are to be joyful um, in the way that we live our lives and that will attract others to us and to Jesus. So thanks for sharing that, Kathleen. All right, well, we'll just wrap up real quickly um, just to kind of just 
touch on a few things. Hope is here. I guess for me personally, I think that's, if I don't remember anything else, I'm going to remember the acronym HOPE and that HOPE is here. Um, the other thing that Becky talked about was name the real, name the obvious. What is it that you see? What is it that you hear? What is it that you feel? It's that open line of communication. And then remembering the promises, um, I think you had them written down somewhere. I'm just going to read them really quickly because they were really good. Um, you are never alone. Jesus invites us into relationship. We always belong. Our identity is secure because God will never stop loving us. You are a beloved child of God. And God helps us to reimagine ourselves. Those are powerful. And the last couple points that she made was being a still point. We must connect with our still point so that we can then be a still point for others. And again, what an honor to do that for our, other, for our sisters, our families, our neighbors, our friends. And lastly, being a vessel, being that conduit through which Jesus can pour through and then out. And um, just to share that light and to share that love. That's the message of hope, which is beautiful, especially for a time as now that we are living through. So well, I think that's kind of our, our wrap up. Thank you, Leslie. She's so awesome. Um, that's why I love doing things like this with her. Um, so we hope you've enjoyed tonight. Thank you so much for coming. Um, again, I wanted to thank Sister Talk and Women's Council for working together in um, bringing this to you. Um, I also wanted to thank Ed, who will be back in a second. He makes everything so beautiful. And Dawn in the EV booth, and to our logistics team who sat everybody. It is a very difficult time for them, and I appreciate them. Um, but we don't want tonight to end. So what we've done is we've planned two other things, and that is that we will be having a book group meet uh, starting August 12th for six or seven weeks. And we're going to be reading Becky's book, The Inner Chapel. Um, and then, like she mentioned in the video, she will be back in person this time in October, October 6th, in our new parish center. So we are very excited about that. So you don't have to do both, but we hope that you'll do one, and it would be wonderful if you could do both. Um, we have her book, The Inner Chapel. You might have seen it on your way in. It's for sale outside. It's $15, um, and she has autographed them, and she's put some lovely prayer cards in them as well. If we sell out, because we don't have many copies, um, you can buy it on Amazon, and she said that she would be more than happy to autograph it when she's here in October. Um, and I think... Oh, we have one really fun thing to do right now. So if you'll bear with me, we thought it would be really fun to take a group picture of all of us and send it to Becky. So what we're going to do is there's a camera right up there. Do you see the, the flowers right here? There's a little white camera. And so Dawn is going to scan the room and it takes 30 seconds. So we need to wave or to give a thumbs up or um, any other kind of cheer you want to do. Um, and smile with your eyes, like uh, Father Gabe tells us. So if we can do that, all right, so let's start. And Don will tell us when we're ready. <laughs> She's like halfway, I think. <laughs> I can see it moving. All right, we're almost there. <laughs> Keep smiling. All right, are we good? All right, thank you.
Thank you. I will post that on social media too so we can see it ourselves. Yes. So one other housekeeping item before we say our prayer and our closing song, and that is as we leave, we're going to be leaving like we do mass. So that means from the back to the front, and if you could go through the narthex outside to this beautiful evening, and then we can catch up and chat with each other. So, now we wanted to close with a beautiful prayer by St. Francis de Sales. Um, and I thought we could pray it all together. All right. Do not look forward in fear to the changes in life. Rather, look to them with full hope that as they arise, God, whose very own you are, will lead you safely through all things. And when you cannot stand it, God will carry you in his arms. Do not fear what may happen tomorrow. The same everlasting Father who cares for you today will take care of you every day. He will either shield you from suffering or will give you unfailing strength to bear it. Be at peace and put aside all anxious thoughts and imaginations. Amen. Thank you. So Ed's going to close us in song. Hey, yeah, don't go yet. I've been waiting right. all night. I know. You can't go yet. <laughs> so Ed's going to close us in song, and then we'll make our way out. Thanks, everybody. Good night. So, so I was playing this melody throughout the meditation time so that you would hear it and kind of catch on to it. We have sung this before at Mass, and it's based on an old hymn, My Hope is Built on Nothing Less than Jesus' blood and righteousness, and it's called Cornerstone. So I thought we could sing that as our closing song tonight. Just in his righteousness alone.